Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Jamie McCallum. I <clears throat> uh, teach sociology at Middlebury College right now, but uh, I was uh, one of Stanley's students for many years and was on the board of directors of the Left Forum with him for a number of years um, as well. And this morning I was in the first part of the conference and today I'll be out this afternoon moderating this panel with um, uh, a lot more folks, uh, former students and, and activists, allies and comrades of Stanley's. Um, so I'm just joining this sort of group last minute, but as I understand it, um, I'm gonna call on folks and you'll have about five minutes to um, offer some remarks and thoughts and reflections on what Stan Lee's work and life and friendship and whatever meant to you. And then I'll just call the next person. And we have time remaining, we can sort of talk amongst ourselves and, and whatnot. So, uh, uh, and please let me know if something's going on that I should pay attention to when, when someone else is speaking. Um, so I wanted to start us off by, by calling on uh, Susanna Walters. Hi, thanks, Jamie. Uh, I'm Susanna Walters. I direct the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program at Northeastern, where I also edit the feminist journal Signs. And uh, it's, um, it's, it's a privilege to be here. Stanley meant, meant a lot to me, like he did to everyone here. Um, I met Stanley in, I guess, it was probably about 84 when I came to study with him. But we had a backstory, which is that he knew my mother and my aunt, um, which is how I came to study with him. My, my uh, family is all Reds, um, and uh, my aunt and, uh, and, and Stanley knew each other through IPS, the Institute for Policy Studies. And I think my mother um, uh, through SNCC, but I'm not quite sure where they knew each other. I was in New York and ready to start graduate school. And my mother said, hey, maybe you should look up this guy named Stanley. And so I looked up this guy named Stanley. Uh, I went to his office and we it just hit it off. It was clear I was going, I mean, it, honestly, that's how I became a sociologist. If he had been a historian, uh, I would have gotten my PhD in history. Um, I had no allegiance to the discipline, um, neither does Stanley, which is what we bonded on, uh, not having any allegiances to any disciplines. Um, and uh, we just hit it off and, and, and that was, it was love at first sight for me. Um, but it, but a, a couple, I got a, only about, I guess, two months or so into my graduate work. And I think I was Stanley's RA that first year as well. Um, although I can't honestly remember, it's a long time ago, but I think so. Um, a few months into uh, working with him, my father uh, died precipitously. Um, and very, very suddenly. And, you know, I didn't know Stanley well, but he really stepped in. Uh, he was, uh, I cried on his shoulder endlessly. Um, and he was this rare thing that every feminist will know is true. He was paternal without being paternalistic. Um, it was a rare, a rare gift. Uh, not many men do that, as we all know. Um, so it was really quite wonderful for me. He was, uh, you know, both um, a comrade, a teacher, and, and this, you know, sort of paternal figure for me in a lot of ways. Um, he was also in that, in that mode, I think, one of the things I remember most about him um, is that he was, he was really a mensch, uh, and a leftist mensch without being an annoying brochalist. Um, you know, he again, and, and, and of course, he partnered with one of the great feminists of all time, Ellen Willis, um, which says a lot about him and about his values as a, a feminist. Um, and he, he knew when, and this was, this was unusual, I think, again, something unusual. He knew when, uh, unlike most male leftists of, of my familiarity, um, he knew when to shut the fuck up. Uh, so that when I um, uh, started a dissertation with him on uh, mothers and daughters in popular culture, he sort of, at some point, he, he realized it's like he didn't know what anything to fuck about that, you know? Well, like, what did he know about this? And he was, he, what, he, what he did, which was an amazing thing for a mentor, is that he knew that I knew more. 
And he let me know that I knew more, that I was the feminist in the room. Uh, I was the feminist scholar in the room. Uh, and I could learn from him, of course, about shaping cultural theory. I worked in cultural studies um, about, about you know, political theory, all of it. But that he also knew that he could not um, direct this dissertation from a place of that, of, of that kind of deep knowledge, which was um, quite astounding, I think, for a person who knew so much and had such a wide range of knowledge. It really showed uh, a kind of uh, feminist politics in action. And one other, just one other memory I have, I have a million memories because I really did adore him and, and, and kept in touch over the years, although not as much as I, I should have probably. Um, but one year um, uh, there, I missed some meeting with him. And I, I missed it because I was involved with a group, a guerrilla action group at the time called Anonymous Women for Peace. And we did all kinds of crazy shit all over the city. And um, I said to him, I knew I was going to miss this meeting. And I remember saying, well, look, you know, I, I can't, I, I know it's important. It was about my dissertation or something important like that. But I, I've got to, I'm, you know, we're taking over Madison Square Park. Uh, that day. So sorry, I can't show up. And lo and behold, Stanley shows up at Madison Square Park in solidarity. And, um, you know, for me, that was everything. It's like uh, the dissertation advisor that is your buddy on the line, on the picket line, is the kind of dissertation advisor you want. Um, and uh, that, that kind of activism uh, and commitment to social justice um, with humor, with, um, with a gentleness and kindness um, was really what I remember most about him and, and what enabled so many of us, I think, um, to, to have the kinds of professional activist lives that we have. So thank you, Stanley. Love you. Great. Thank you so much. That's a great, such a great note to start off on. Thank you, Susanna. Um, uh dan douglas thanks jamie and thanks susanna those were that was really excellent um i'm dan douglas i am from brooklyn i currently teach sociology and ed studies at trinity college in hartford um i stanley was on my dissertation committee but i guess i'll start this way stanley was the kind of person that you would hear about um, and I first heard about Stanley when I was an undergrad at St. John's University in Queens. Um, and I'd studied with Bill DeFazio and Rod, Rod Bush. And so Stanley was kind of part of my intellectual imagination from that point on. Um, and in a certain way, like he was a bit of a legend. And for me uh, at that point, and it was one of the reason, one of the primary reasons I decided to go to the grad center. So I didn't have like any personal connections with Stanley, but I certainly had this kind of intellectual connection with him that was like, this is one of the people you go to. Um, my first time meeting Stanley was in, a, in one of his courses that was called The Political Economy of Global Capitalism. And at some point during that first class, he described me as half educated and ill read, which since Stanley was from the Bronx and I was from Brooklyn, I took as a compliment. Um, uh, the first time I worked closely with him, along with a few other students, um, we did a close study of the New York Times international section. Um, and it was interesting because he introduced me to Basil Bernstein's Class Codes and Control, which is a book that kind of piqued my interest in education, maybe for the first time in grad school. Um, and that I still talk about when I meet working class students who are at a place like Trinity College for the first time. Um, to help them understand like what's what's going on there. Um, I guess it's needless to say that I became a regular in every course I could uh, take that had Stanley's name uh, as the instructor. Um, and these classes all had great titles like that first one and reflected Stanley's just endless knowledge and eclectic tastes. And I think that that was, you know, it was just one of those relationships that got started that way. Um, so, but really the defining kind of event of my life and that of a few others, including other people, including one other person who will speak today, was a seven year long study group that lasted from September of 2011 to June of 2018, 
Um, in that time, a uh, few of us read with, along with Stanley at his house, 11 books. And 11 books in seven years means we spent a lot of time on each one. Um, we started with Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. We went through a number of works by Freud and Lacan, Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, Merleau-Ponty's Visible and the Invisible, de Beauvoir's Ethics of Ambiguity, and we closed with Deleuze and Guattari's Anti-Oedipus. So we really spanned a, a, a wide gamut that I know, I know on the last panel people were talking about from consciousness to subjectivity, and I feel like the interests that we went through with this study group really reflected that move towards subjectivity and intersubjectivity, which I think he actually gets from some of that from phenomenology. Um, four or five of us gathered at Stanley's house nearly every Friday during term times. We also went up to his house upstate occasionally to kind of continue our readings. I remember us reading the three essays on sexuality, Freud's essays um, up there. Um, and as you can, you know, the reading list was set to high standards, but to facilitate our reading, we brought bagels and cream cheese and French roast coffee, and these things were also set to high standards. Um, and so I think that we also, we learned how to um, come together as a group um, to read text, but also to understand that there was life to be had. Um, I would argue, you know, I mean, I would tell anyone who asks that this, that these seven years that we spent as a group were the most important intellectual experience of my life. Um, and a not just, you know, a not for credit experience that kind of offers an alternative to the kind of credentialing and schooling that I know that Stanley didn't, you know, uh, didn't, didn't exactly subscribe to. Um, but I guess the thing is, given the time from 2011 to 2018, um, it introduced us to a, a person that's substantially different from the Stanley Aronowitz that you know, a lot of people have written about and spoken about since he transitioned, like that was not, he was not the same person that I, that I read about in these, in these stories. Um, he was also not just the legend I heard about in college. He was a man. He was a, he was, a, he, um, and one who spent a long and remarkable life pursuing praxis in the sense that Marx meant it. Um, but he had flaws and seeing someone as often as we did, those flaws showed um, also, he changed in the time that we knew him in those seven years, um, and his health, you know, as folks will know, his health declined, and that affected his mobility and his speech and even, you know, his, his vastly brilliant mind. Um, you know, we in that study group stayed with him throughout that time, and he stayed with us. We wanted it as much as he did. And we kind of continued, we persisted, we persisted as long as, as long to the natural conclusion point of the group when myself and others were finishing their studies and going other places. Um, but I would say that in the end, while I, his brilliance was still there and everyone recognized it, um, uh, you know, that what we we cared for him as a person as he cared for us as as people and that was kind of an important lesson for you know for you know that part part of his life um or that we took from that part of his life i would say that i didn't follow stanley's path into you know social theory i work in applied research i work in policy things around education um but I would say encountering Stanley and doing that kind of rigorous work with him for that amount of time was significant to my intellectual and my political growth um, in the same way that meeting people like Bill DeFazio and Rod Bush was early on in my, in my, in my life. Um, the significance, I guess, is the following. I, I keep Stanley's keen sensibility about what education is and about what education isn't. Um, students in my sociology course read Stanley's masterful, and I have to say that twice and it with an underline, introduction to Paul Willis's learning to labor, which in a few pages kind of distills a century of consensus, critical and cultural theories of education. It's just this beautifully written piece that couldn't summarize, you know, you couldn't summarize educational theory um, or sociology, sociological theories of education quite better than that. Um, you know, in my talks with colleagues, you know, against schooling kind of helps breathe life back into what often becomes kind of reified discussions of Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed to kind of bring it back into what it really, you know, to what it really means as opposed to what people have made it mean. Um, the knowledge factory and the jobless future I work on higher education kind of remind me that 
no matter how far higher education reaches and how many degrees we grant, college and higher education on their own won't solve, you know, won't change the social conditions faced by the mass of working people. We can't educate ourselves out of a, out of a social crisis. Um, and in the midst of, I guess, what I would say is sometimes my very ordinary scientific work, science's power like lingers in my ear, that criticism that says that while I recognize the possibilities for what I do, that could be good things, liberating things, there's as much domination and as much ideology in, built into science as there is, um, you know, potential. Everything that I, you know, I mean, so much of what I got from Stanley over the years was a product of reading closely and in good company. I thank Stanley for allowing us into his home and for his intellectual care. And I hope he felt our care too. Great, thank you so much, Dan. It's really sweet and powerful. Um, Sarah Salmon, I believe, are you calling it from New Zealand? Uh, that's why I have a note yes, here. Yes, I am. You are, right? it's middle of the night there, I think. Um, no, it's so, morning. A morning, whatever. So uh, I will, I'm gonna give people like, a, like a 30 seconds left kind of thing, just so we can make sure everyone gets ample time to speak. Um, okay, great, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, all right, um, so kia ora from New Zealand. It is uh, Saturday morning here, so I am living in the future. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this. Um, it's just, it's wonderful to be, um, to be in such great company um, uh, and, you know, come here just to, to um, uh, celebrate Stanley, who I, you know, I loved very much and I do miss um, dearly. Uh, I, I wanted to sort of uh, just kind of um, pivot off some of the things that were already said. You know, I thought about, uh, you know, Susanna, uh, Susanna's comment around being paternal without being paternalistic. And, um, you know, that, that's how I got to know um, uh, Stanley. So I was doing my PhD in the United States at the City University. Um, uh, and I, my advisor sort of unsud it suddenly uh, uh, passed away and I'd already known Stanley in the context of the study group um, and um, you know I was devastated I didn't really know quite uh, how to move forward um, and I spoke to Stanley about sort of what you know what to do and you know could he be my advisor you know I kind of was really interested in somebody who understood theory who wanted us or was okay with us kind of pursuing our own questions um, and 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 he came through for me and I um, you know, I'm really I'm grateful for that because he, you know, he came in and sort of picked the pieces and in many ways. Um, uh, although we had our disagreements while doing the dissertation, I'm still very, very thankful for Stanley coming through. Um, and I kind of wanted to describe it. I wasn't quite sure how to describe it, but paternal without being paternalistic is just the perfect, um, I think the perfect descriptor. I think it shows a kind of a gentle side to Stanley that he was sort of ambivalent about showing. He didn't really want to show you <laughs> that he was a big softy. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I, uh, and so that's really, that's one of my, um, kind of my favorite, uh, memories of, of, of Stanley. Um, and, but I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, um, uh, the study group, which I think was, was a big, was a big part of, of, um, uh, our relationship with Stanley, you know, so, so Dale mentioned the kind of readings we did. I wanted to also say that the study group was, uh, really the space we kind of, we learned how to think about ideas and how to think about questions. Uh, Stanley sat in the group with us, but didn't really take charge of the group. So we all get to pick our readings. Uh, he picked the very first one, which was the Hegel one. Um, but, you know, after that, we sort of decided on readings, depending on how we felt, you know, what we thought would be interesting to pursue. When we did these readings, uh, you know, Stanley would give us a little bit of a context, but he kind of took a bit of a... Um, uh, uh, you know, a, sort of a back seat would let us ask the questions and move forward in the discussion. Uh, it didn't really give us answers. And um, I think in that, in that way, he allowed us to uh, pursue ideas, um, think through things, but also he allowed himself to see things anew because he had read a lot of these books already. But having, uh, uh, you know, having to sort of reread them with us through our different lenses, our different positions, our different um, orientations to the world, I think, I think it really also changed the way Stanley would understand these texts. And he would admit and say, you know, I used to think this, but now I think, you know, I think you guys are right. Um, and I and I think that's really quite, it's quite refreshing because, you know, as as as, um, as you guys all know, like um, Stanley has this kind of status you know he is this heavyweight social theorist and for him to just say oh yeah you know i like that you know that's sort of like a quite affirming um um 
uh, orientation. Uh, and um, I also think that for Stanley, there was a kind of, there was this joy in, in reading together and learning together. Uh, you know, we went up to his um, summer home sometimes, you know, we had the bagels and the coffee and so on. Uh, but also Stanley used that um, opportunity to also teach us about things like good whiskey and how to drink whiskey. Uh, also gave us a wonderful chicken recipe, which I learned from him. And um, he really liked how, um, you know, we picked some of the cooking tips from Stanley, which I thought was very sweet. Um, and, um, and so that, that was sort of a really wonderful um, period of time. And we were definitely sad um, to, to, you know, to have to move on from that once we moved, you know, across the world. Um, but I also wanted to say that, uh, I also, I suppose, have too many memories. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how Stanley didn't really want to be identified. So he didn't want to be identified as a sociologist, a labor organizer, a labor study scholar. And I think part of it is that Stanley really didn't want to be uh didn't want didn't want that kind of stillness of these kinds of identifications because he just wanted to pursue knowledge and and write about things um from all sorts of perspectives um and and i think that that's why he didn't really want it's not that he didn't think that there's any sort of merit in any of these things but that he wanted to be everything um and i think he got to be um in that sense um I will uh, end on the note around what I learned from Stanley. So I teach at the moment in a big, um, big institute in New Zealand. And one of the things I learned from Stanley is how to uh, um, uh, how to persuade your audience and you know how to how to come across with an idea that might be counterintuitive for your audience. Um, and Stanley was really, really good at intuiting who his audience was. Um, and I'll just give like just an example. Um, so in uh, 2013, when the um, the Gramsci Monument uh, was um, was built in Forest Homes in the Bronx, uh, Stanley was one of the invited speakers, and uh, you know we'd gone to see him speak, and um, you know he knew he knew the audience, you know, which was the people who were living in um, uh, Forest Homes, uh, you know, young um, uh, black men and women, uh, some were children sitting in the audience, and he was talking about hegemony in the context of racial profiling. Um, and in the context of the monumental election of President Obama, and and I thought it was really, it was such an it was it was such a wonderful way to engage the audience and get them to think about this. If you know Stanley, you know that he would be very critical of Obama, but he wasn't reducing Obama to the Democratic Party in that moment. He knew that there was something historic about the election of of Obama as the first black president, and he wanted people to know that, and he wanted that to be recognized. Um, and and then sort of pivot into questions around well what is racial profiling well how does it happen in this country and and so on and I thought it was quite wonderful really to be able to persuade someone to think about things slightly differently by first sort of understanding well where where can we meet um, uh, in the middle and I take that when I teach because I teach I teach in um, sociology and I teach in criminology where students you know some students are uh, you know they want to be in law they want to be police officers and how do we how do I slowly sort of nudge them away from that um, and I think I, I tend to look for um, for Stanley uh, and Stanley's way of talking and knowing his audience persuading people to arrive at their own conclusion um, in that way um, I'll end it here uh, I do I, I love you and I miss you Stanley and I'm really happy um, that I get a chance to say goodbye great thank you so much Sarah so sweet, so nice. Um, James, James Retos, do you have a few minutes of reflections to share? Yes, I do. Um, I appreciate so much the opportunity to say a few words about Stanley and thank you all so very, very much for organizing this wonderful, wonderful conference. Uh, I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College uh, here in New York and Yeshiva University as well, but uh, I also host the Radical Imagination one hour weekly cable television show on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. My friendship and relationship with Stanley, unlike many of yours, has developed and deepened only in the last seven, eight, nine years or so. Stanley was my co-host on the very first show a little over six years ago, November 11th, 2015. Cornell West joined us as well. We did several shows with and about Stanley over the years. Michael Pelius, Henry Giroux, 
Manny Ness, Immortal Technique, and Cornell joined me on these shows. But Stanley was always the driving inspirational force, whether he was on or not. That first show ended with Stanley first leading Cornell and I through a, redent, a, a rendition of This Little Light of Mine, and then a resounding version of Solidarity Forever. Stanley's radical imagination and natural ebullience had taken over. He wanted the show to have a rousing start in a new venture to help transform the world. Whether you, he was discussing Immortal Technique's new hip uh, and lyrics, or rap lyrics, I should say, with him, or encouraging us to listen to the revolutionary rhythms and tones of Shostakovich's 10th Symphony, his favorite, he seemed always to be a few steps ahead, forever trying to push the envelope forward. He also was a fierce battler, nobody's fool. Even in his weakened state in his later years, he tried as best he could to protect his beloved left forearm from those that were using bullying tactics and threats to wrest control and power in unethical ways. He understood full well that a progressive organization like Left Forum couldn't and shouldn't countenance that behavior. If there were those acting that way toward their fellow comrades, it would be a reflection on the organization and show how unsuited it was to help bring about a more humane world. We all know about Stanley and his love of life and food. It's already been mentioned a number of times. Tech, Cornell, and I would try and visit him as often as we could in his apartment and during his rehab days. We knew he truly loved and appreciated the visits, but he also kept a close eye on what we were carrying with us. A bag loaded with pastrami sandwiches and fries from Ben's Kosher Deli was the official ticket that got you definitely in and through the door for the action. Several words should be said about Katie his wonderful caretaker for five and a half years. They developed a true bond and love over those years. Stanley simply grew on you. Katie understood him and she grew on him. Katie had what it took to understand his humanness in all its forms and complexity and gave back to him in a way that any visitor could see and take in. She made any visit to Stanley an added joy. The last show that Stanley appeared on was September 8th, 2019. It was one of his last public appearances. We decided to call the show what an independent left would look like. He was still animated and passionate, sharp as ever, ready to do battle with the world in his larger than life way. We tried to set up a couple more shows together. Stanley was willing. We came close, but they never came to be. He left us much too soon. It's next to impossible to not love Stanley. He certainly kept me on my intellectual and emotional toes from that very first show. It's next to impossible to not have been moved by him. He touched me to the core of my humanity. He became family with all the wonderful complexities that that entails. That enormous light of his will shine and glow as long as there are radical imaginations. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Solidarity and radical love forever stand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. Oh, thank you so much, James. Thank you so much. I would like like to tune into your show soon. Now that I know about it. Great. Um, uh, David Winters, are you here? Would you like to offer a few thoughts? 
Yes, I am. Thanks so much. You can hear me. Everything's good. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is David Winters. I um, I don't know. I've got like five or six hundred words written out to keep myself on time, and I'll I'll uh, jump into those in, in just a second. Although I have an aversion to to reading um, planned remarks, um, an aversion I, I guess I, I shared with Stanley. Um, but yeah, I so I'm currently a PhD candidate in media studies at uh, at Rutgers, um, New Brunswick. I'm, a, I'm an adjunct professor. I have been for almost a decade now. Uh, I've designed and delivered uh, dozens of courses to hundreds uh, of students. Um, and I'm uh, also a former uh, elected official in uh, an adjunct faculty union. Um, I, I thank Stanley for the opportunities that he gave me for the first set of those. And I blame Stanley slightly for uh, making me think it's a good idea to get involved in union politics. Um, uh, so I'm going to say a couple of things about um, uh, about how I met Stanley. Just take a minute with that. I'm going to say a couple of things about how Stanley's work like impacts me and how I think of Stanley's work. I'm not going to be very tangible about that. I'm not going to cite. I'm just going to talk through, um, yeah, some of the more important sort of uh, uh, moments um, of effect on my thinking. Um, so like everyone throughout the day, if I have a slightly different Stanley than um, than other folks. Other folks is Stanley, then you know I think that that makes a lot of sense, and hopefully we'll uh, at the next conference we'll get into arguing about whose uh, whose Stanley is the most effective Stanley for thinking about things going forward and all that good stuff, right? Um, okay, so when I met Stanley, um, I had most recently worked as a corporate brand strategist for a fast food brand uh, that was trying to find ways. This is true that was trying to find ways to increase trust among, and this is their demographic language for it, right? African-American audiences in low income neighborhoods. This is a, the gross demographic sort of articulation that I was working with, right? So my last job as a corporate brand strategist. So my last act as a corporate brand strategist was to tell my client fast food uh, company that they should turn their fast food locations in impoverished neighborhoods without access to quality food into grocery stores. And that would build trust, and like that would that would be the only strategy that they were going to get from me. So this was my last act as a as a corporate brand strategist. Um, it was lucky, uh, or not exactly lucky, that I had already uh, made my way into the grad center and and was taking my first course with uh, with Stuart Ewan. It's also uh, at one point a, a student of Stanley's. Um, in the next year, uh, in the fall of two thousand eight, I wandered into Stanley's classroom uh, because he was teaching a course called the Sociology of Everyday Life. And I thought if I was going to figure out what the hell uh, the advertising industry was all about and why uh, I had spent years working my way into an industry that claimed to be as democratic as any industry could possibly be, figuring out how advertising actually worked and why it worked the way that it did was important to me. And Stuart Ewan was, was my entry into that. After a year of taking Stuart's courses, I thought the sociology of everyday life is, is what I need to know about. I had no idea that this course was going to be about Henri Lefebvre. I had never read a word of Marx. Um, uh, I had to keep pages long lists of the references that Stanley and his other students, Dan and, and Sarah, among other folks, Tom, uh, all folks on this panel uh, uh, were around then. Incredibly intimidating, you know? I was coming from, in many ways, everyday life. I was not of the academy. I was not of the left. I was not of uh, activism or theory. These things were not. Um, uh, tangible to me. I couldn't desire to get into these things because I didn't know they existed until I, I, I walked into Stanley's room and met Stanley and all these amazing people around Stanley. So Stanley saw uh, what I was dealing with. Um, and, and as he said, I had a lot of catching up to do. And, uh, and Stanley gave me the chance to do it. Um, uh, folks have talked about the kind of relationships that they had with Stanley. I, you know, I followed Stanley everywhere that he was teaching for five, six, seven years, reading groups, classes, talks, anywhere I could go. Um, this is how I knew Stanley. I was so intimidated by Stanley and by the people around him that it was, I mean, it was tough. It was tough to, to relax and be social, you know, with Stanley for me and with the students around Stanley too. This was an atmosphere that I, I, I so badly needed to connect to. And I was afraid everybody was gonna figure out that I was stupid and didn't belong there. And so I had to be, you know, guarded to some degree and whatever. Um, but Stanley gave me the opportunity, right? And he didn't need to give me, uh, uh, I love this phrase too, a half educated and barely read really MA student at the time of day, but he gave me a support and uh, a kind of recognition and acceptance and invitation to connect with a political and intellectual community that I'm not sure I would have survived without. Um, 
and everyone in my life re referred to him as my buddy Stanley, even though, you know, it was all um, classroom, you know, uh, I learned from Stanley. So I'm going to say a couple things about Stanley's work and how it hit me, and then I'm going to piss off a couple people because I can't imagine how to remember Stanley more appropriately. Um, and then I'll be done about another two minutes. So for me, um, Stanley's is, uh, we, we've talked about the crisis in historical materialism quite a bit today, which is great. Science has power as well, uh, and how class works. These are like the three moments that I, I think are sort of the, the uh, most important moments in Stanley's herb, and, and um, we're talking about them already, so this is great, right? Um, so Stanley, for me, uh, engaged in a materialism that was an anti-orthodox, anti-dogmatic, dynamic materialism, right? That takes as the material to be worked with, the concrete interactions within and between the moments of everyday life, within and between movements, within and between everyday life and movements, within and between everyday life movements and the environment, within and between everyday life movements, the environment and the received historical, cultural and political contexts, all semi-autonomous and irretrievably entangled. Everything in motion, no predetermined or inevitable trajectories, actions and possibilities and the ways they confront and influence one another, irrevocably responding to and changing the other. Maybe Stanley's work, and, and to me, this is how it works, right? Moves beyond the tarry with the negative because that tarry is not absent in his work, but fully incorporated into the tragic knowledge that we can't do anything meaningful if we're afraid of dying. If we fear losing the institutions we're used to and that we depend on to make sense of ourselves. So nothing meaningful will get done without risking everything. But from within the assumption of an ongoing tarry with the negative, Stanley opens up a tarry with the positive challenging us to articulate and live our conceptions of our capacity to act, our desire to intervene, our will to create, and our courage to care. So here's the last part. Stanley taught me that fear eats the soul. And I think we have to consider the possibility that we on the left are being devoured by the fear of moving forward without the comfort and security of nostalgia for a past that probably didn't exist the way we imagine it anyway. We have to struggle with our fear we have to tarry with the negative and allow what's past to be put out of our way. If we want to remember Stanley, let's take his work seriously in our practice. Let's follow the insight he gives us through false promises and question the wisdom of socialist talking union leaders and professionalized organizers who run supposedly progressive trade unions from within closed organizing committees that develop policy and strategic messaging to be delivered to memberships as audiences the same way corporate brands and the Democratic Party do. Let's stop working to capture the raw, upsurging energy of rank and file activists and funneling that energy into the aporias of collective begging and grievance management and begin, finally, to fully engage in the fight for workers' autonomy over the times and spaces of our work and everyday life. If we want to remember Stanley, let's read the invocation of science and facts as the final arbiter of intellectual and social debate as an expression of liberal hegemony and relearn how to interrogate science as power from a critical left perspective. It's vital the left begin to challenge a right-wing critique of science that is quickly gaining traction among the working class, such as that exists. Finally, if we want to remember Stanley, we need to take seriously his closing remarks during one of his last public appearances, where he complimented his, Fred, his friend Fred Jameson's contribution to radically, to radically imagining a different world, where Stanley argued, as he often did, against the nostalgia, against nostalgia, and for a radical vision of the future. Quote, Stanley's words, without a vision, without a proposal for how to change or what to change to, without a discussion of what the implications of those changes are, then what we're fated to become is simply a vanishing breed of romantics and a vanishing breed of sentimentalists, end quote. So I hope we can carry on Stanley's memory by finally taking seriously the need for this discussion and facing up to all the joy and tragedy of the sharp intra-class conflict that discussion must entail for it to be a meaningful act of class formation. This is how I remember Stanley. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I have the, the um, unenviable position today of moderating all of you. And uh, I wanna make sure that everyone gets time uh, to speak. I'm, I'm only more glad that I'm not actually moderating Stanley himself. Um, so uh, that would be much harder to think. So George Jordanis, Hope I'm saying your name right. Um, do you have a few minutes of reflections to share? I do, but let me begin with uh, quoting Stanley from uh, The Knowledge Factory on page 188. 
Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth towers in the growing field of African diasporic studies, together with Albert Memmi's The Colonizer and the Colonized. The more contemporary essay by Gayatri of Spivak, Can the Subaltern Speak? This is from 2000. One of the most anthologized in the post-colonial critical literature and Edward Said's Orientalism. These are arguably four classic works in the counter canon that's one point I'm trying to get to, but any core curriculum would be hard pressed to omit a serious examination of some of these texts. In contrast to the way these works have been opposed to the Western canon, my inclusion treats them as having been deeply influenced by aspects of the Western philosophical and social theoretical canon, as well as constituting counterpoints to them. A unit on colonialism and post-colonial thought might, for example, focus on Fanon's dialogue with psychoanalysis, phenomenology, and Marxism. Skipping ahead another sentence, the learning community would organize its time according to its own convenience rather than accommodating to university rules. My strategy for the core is to see science, philosophy, and literature within a historical framework. Michael Pelius is doing that, and I thank him so much for carrying on that, that aspect of the tradition. Um, one of the panelists, Daniel, who I don't know, um, you read uh, a number of uh, Stanley's uh, recommended readings as well. And in terms of knowing Stanley, I, I begin with that because uh, I go back to 1985 or six or so when I was studying economics at the New School and I first heard Stanley speaking at the New York Marxist School on Rosa Luxemburg. And uh, afterwards, sometime how I contacted him and uh, he said, well, come over my house. So I went to his house in Brooklyn. I was in his house in Queens. I was in his apartment in the village. I was in his apartment in Manhattan. I missed out on the upstate trip, but uh, I come before you a little bit. Stanley had the biggest heart in the world. And he was open to so much new things. So as we talk about his works and his uh, eclectic nature, his paternal, whatever you said, paternalistic paternalism, he was like an uncle to me, about 15 years older. And, uh, but one aspect of his work uh, was science and science's power came up today. And uh, in terms of his influence on my back wall is a quincunx um, that was a device Francis Galton developed when I worked with Stanley or Stanley worked with me on uh, the theories of uh, genetics and uh, social statistics and the sociology of science because he knew that science was culturally based too and uh, more so. so his, his great work on science's power and uh, historical materialism was, th those were the two, or the knowledge factory would be three, the three books that influenced me the most. But most of all, before anything, he was always fun to be with. His classes were fun. Um, and uh, I miss him to death every day. Great, thank you so much, George. Really appreciate those thoughts. Um, David Singer, are you here? David, I think your camera's off. Everything's off, now I'm on. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, I'm gonna be brief. I was a student of Stanley's, I don't know, starting in the 1990s. And all I can say is that everything I learned from Stan Stanley was like, changed my mind about everything else. And I'm not going to say much more because people who are much more articulate about him and things have said things and will said, say things. But I will say this. Occasionally, when I wasn't with Stanley, I would think about an issue and I would say to myself, what would Stanley think? And I was not able to answer that because Stanley would always think creatively and with imagination and nothing I could imagine would be what Stanley would think. Anyway, I just 
I'm going to end with a little anecdote. Um, in 2004, I decided I wanted to, to teach, and I spoke to Stanley about um, where would be a good place to start. And he gave me the names of about 10 people at different institutions in New York City. And I spoke to a number of them. They were all wonderfully helpful. And the first real in-person contact I had um, was a chairman of a sociology department. Um, and I went to him and I said, okay, Stanley Rodwitz recommended I talk to you about teaching sociology. And I handed him my, my resume, which he put away. And he said, okay, what course do you want to teach? <laughs> that was, that was the deal. His reputation was such that that was all you needed. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, Tom Buchel, you are up next. Tom, how's it going? Oh, it's great. Thanks. <laughs> um, I uh, apologize for what is going to be the necessary extemporaneous nature of this brief presentation, but I just found out I was going to be doing this not, you know, a few hours ago and I had other, uh, anyway, let me get to the point. <laughs> uh, I came to Stanley in many ways the same way I came to academia. Uh, a, you know, what Sir Wright Mills calls the intersection of biography and history. Uh, the circumstances uh, which is to say, I, the same way I came into politics and intellectual life, and especially left intellectualism, which was initially through culture, um, something that was always a focus in Stanley's work. And I think I really was drawn to the way he connected the experience of culture uh, as central to any meaningful politics, right? whether you're talking about the labor movement uh, in particular or radicalism in general. Um, Stanley, you know, and it's been said, of course, many times today, uh, the way he, there was no separation between his everyday life politics, his cultural politics, and his understanding of the left, his understanding of political activity. Um, when I came to the Graduate Center, and you know, I didn't really know who he was until, I think it was actually through Jamie, uh, he gave a talk on left turn, uh, maybe the spring before uh, at Blue Stockings. I, uh, <laughs> I remember this too, in terms of that, uh, it, it was either you or um, our mutual friend Malov who introduced us, me to Stanley, uh, and I wanted to register to his first class at fall, uh, which was psychoanalysis and social theory, which was way over my head at the time, but I am glad I took it. Uh, I've come back to those readings quite a bit since then, but first time meeting Stanley, uh, I say, I, hello, I'm gonna be a new student at the Graduate Center. I'd like to take your class. He asked me, have you read Lacan? I said, yep. He's like, all right, you can take it. You know. <laughs> Haven't been read too much of Lacan, but that was uh, that got me into the class, I guess. Uh, when I was there at the Graduate Center, I eventually, you know, I took about four or so classes with him. I uh, hung around, <laughs> asking him questions. Uh, he would often note in giving talks about his students, particularly me, always being there, asking questions. <laughs> uh, I eventually became the assistant to that center he had, which was originally the Center for Cultural Studies, and then became the culture, uh, the Center for the Study of Culture, Technology, or Work. Uh, I won't go on too much about what the Graduate Center did to it, 
since Stanley left, but it is a disgrace, but I, I, I digress. Um, Cause that was also the space for the left forum. Um, being there at that center, essentially, and you know, the additional income from being a grad assistant gave me that space to explore and to indulge my intellectual interests that I would not have been afforded otherwise. I, I, I really don't think because the way graduate school, the way the academic system has been neoliberalized, it's very much about working towards a credential. Uh, you know, everything is kind of just checking a mark off a box. You took this class, you can move on. And uh, it addles, you know, it, it assumes that part that time that Stanley, again, and Jamie wrote very articulately about this, uh, that politics, the time needed for a left politics to engage in ideas even, to uh, do the serious intellectual work. He understood that as part and parcel of his politics and of his life. And, um, you know, something else I definitely gained from him through this work, uh, probably the main expression of it has been through my teaching. Um, it, what we read and how we read it. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting the uh, let's go sign. So let me <laughs> exit this. Uh, I teach among other students, design students, and I always emphasize not only that they should try to get a job, of course, that's part of it, but think seriously about the technologies of the design you're using because how they're owned uh you know how you use them is built into larger structures of capital and it reproduces you and your work as a node in that structure anyway uh i will end it at that <laughs> great thank you so much tom tom it's great to see you here by the way you as well um Ben Shepard, Ben, it's nice to see you here. I remember I first met you in Stanley's class many years ago. Uh, you are on, go ahead. Thank you. Jamie, Jamie, can we share the screen for just 30 seconds? I promise it won't be too inappropriate. What, what do you want me to do? I don't know how to uh, do it. Or I can share the screen. Here, I'll do it. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. This picture uh, is from December 2014. And it's a picture of one of us at one of, at one of the reading groups. I think this was still at the Breck Forum. Uh, or the left forum, whatever, whatever um, on Atlantic Avenue. And uh, you've got Phil, you've got Jim Farratt and Stanley after we were all having an argument and Stanley was saying movements are doing nothing. And Jim Farratt, who is part of the, the yippies, young lords from the, you know, act up was saying, you know, you're half asleep, you're not paying attention. And look at the expression on everybody's faces, right? Like we all, we all disagreed. And that's like, that. I think that's to me the, that moment is the is the fun of learning the fun of the discourse the fun of disagreeing he called me i'm benjamin shepherd i'm a social worker and i got heckled i mean it's un you know i mean unending heckling as a social worker uh an actionista unending heckling i mean it's a long tradition of that and yet there's this warmth and i think so that i'll just talk about three moments with stanley um and maybe I'll, and i want to read a little bit i read I, I immediately wrote when he died i think about my meeting with him in 2004 with Jamie and my friends in auditing the class and talking too much and having a good day in the class and having him say, Ben, you know, stop while you're ahead. Okay. Like, thanks. That was a good interpretation, but let's, let's move on here. Um, and the other people are actually taking the class. So please then, but, but he talked about community gardens being sources for transformation and that regular activists had created space and transformed space. And he connected with Lefebvre and he connected it with a whole history of ideas in reclaiming com a community garden and reclaiming places for play. My dissertation was on play and he, in, in False Promises, talks about that dialectic of work and play and helped me situate that play in a history of ideas. And that was so important and fun. And so, okay, so I'll tell another moment. Um, and I think that I, I don't know if I would have gotten my PhD without those references, because you helped me reframe a whole history of ideas in that. There's another moment, which is March 2014, right before that picture was taken. 
um, I think it's three days after my dad died. And uh, I got an email saying, Stanley was doing some talks in Brooklyn, a reading group. And I brought my, both of my kids who are at this point, I think seven and four or something like that. And we, they sat in the hall and Stanley chatted with them in the rest of the group, you know, and it's a social theory class, right? But like Stanley thought they were hilarious. They sat there for about 45 minutes and then they ran in and said, Stanley said, your kids are striking Ben. Okay. It's time to go. Okay. Like, but again, we're trying and we're having fun learning together. And I think that was that spirit. It was so fun. I mean, I, I wanna, if you have time and, J and Jamie, you can tell me, I've got a couple of quotes from the talks that were, I think very witty. Then um, then a final meeting, which was, so I had, I took the class for about five, 2014 until 2019 when it ended or 20, yeah, in 2018, we read Adorno together and it was wonderful. And I, we didn't agree a lot. I, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I like Roosevelt. I like the Democrats. You know, we, can dis we can disagree, right? It happens. Don't always like the Democrats, whatever. That's another conversation. But it was fun to have that space. So I go to visit him the last time. And Katie, thanks for mentioning Katie James because she was so wonderful. I got the, you know, I got the green light. I walked in and she gave me, I think, 20 minutes, you know, because she could see he was getting tired. He was reading Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain. And and, you know, and, and, and we sat and talked and we sort of covered the Stanley greatest hits. We talked about Balzac and I know Balzac and the human strain. And he talked about how Marx was wanting to read Balzac at the end of his days and how important it would have been to have that study that Marx reading because Marx read a lot of literature. Right. That's a big part of this of his work. I talked about visiting Gramsci's house that previous summer and Stanley talked about we talked about looking at El Criderno, the prison notebooks, where they were written, you know, like, like in a room reproducing the, the jail cell. Um, then we talked to his, his, his sort of going into his labyrinth a little bit. We talked a little bit about Faulkner and Borges, John, George Luis Borges. And he talked about, we talked about Latin American literature, but he talked about the, the labyrinth. And I think, and I started thinking, and I'll just read a little bit about what I was thinking there is within the dialectic, Everyone has a different reading of dialectic. I started in all the periods when you read uh, Adorno's introduction to dialectics, I started hear, hearing it almost poetically, listening to Stanley. So I wrote a little, a few words about Stanley. I'll, and James, you can give me the hook. It wouldn't be the first time. So, you know, if you need to, but it was always about the factory. Factory is a place for reproduction, uh, for knowledge production, for, means of, for a means of production, for autonomy, for class struggle, for observation, for a union hall, for breaks, for reimagining the workday, for reading a novel, for organizing, for getting away with it, for false promises. Maybe it was a place where we let it get away. We lost it. Boris had his labyrinth. Stanley had his factory. Ever ascending into the dark depths, getting lost, coming out with books, lots of books. I loved going there with him. He was the consummate tour guide. Um, I'll read a couple of uh, a couple of the lectures very briefly. Um, he said, "Dialectics is about the movement of history. The movement of history is a, is the guiding thread to enable us to grasp human beings in their social activities." Since Stanley read led us through a rousing reading of Adorno's Introduction to Dialectics, and his stories were always what I loved. I love the bio, bio, the the intros on those moments. So. Um, we, introduced, we, we concentrated on lecture nine, in which Adorno recalled the memory of Walter Benjamin. I'm going to say something scientific now, noted Stanley. He generally thought of Benjamin as the cat's piss. And uh, he was generally admiring his admiration did not extend to anarchism. Okay, so there we go. He, you know, thought of, Adorno thought of Benjamin as the cat's piss. Here's another one. Um, we were talking about Walt Whitman and he says, well, What's Walt Whitman's contradiction, asked Stanley, referring to the queer sensibilities he didn't always see when we read Leaves of Grass when he was 14. Well, maybe I didn't read it closely, he thought, uh, without looking at the essence, appearance of the living contradiction between what Marcuse saw as the movement of things from that which they are not to that which they are. Ideas collide with shapes through time, poetry pointing us outside to something more beautiful. If you want to be a secure person, Stanley declares out of nowhere, don't take a secure job. Let it go. Be free. So 
maybe I, I would, maybe I'll get rid of my secure job, but maybe I won't. Thank you. It's lovely to see everybody. Thanks for organizing. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. That's great. I remember some of those words you posted on Facebook after, after yeah. you passed. Um, Rob Robinson, brother Rob, you have the last word here. Thanks so much. Thank for you, doing. James. Um, good to see you and good to reconnect. And it was uh, students like Jamie and Tom and Malab that was mentioned earlier, Moni, Brady, and Uju that attracted me to the grad center. But I, uh, many of them were students of Neil Smith's, and I'll make that connection to Stanley in a minute. Neil was the person who brought me to the graduate center. Um, and had me lecture his students, but I was hesitant because I only have an undergraduate degree. And when he had heard me at a conference at Columbia University in 2007, he said, um, you're going to come and lecture my students. You taught me, you're going to teach my students. And that brought me up to the grad center. And through a period of time, he started pushing me towards left forum. I joined left forum um, on the panel organizing committee, and I got to know Stanley and Bill Tab and many of the others that were involved in it. And in 2012, I was asked to join the board of Left Forum, of which I'm still a board member. But my relationship with Stanley was strengthened almost when he repeated some of the same things Neil Smith said. In 2014, we're in that office that Tom talked about, and Stanley is in the back. He had split the office with Left Forum. And yeah, if you know Stanley, had that scruffy beard, and he, you know, he opens up the door, hey, Rob, can you come back here a minute? Um, yeah, just a minute, Stan. So I come back. And he says, look, I'm, I'm teaching this course, a history of race and class in America. I never taught it before, but I'm doing a lot on social movements. I don't know that stuff. You know that stuff. You're, you're all over the world with these social movements. Can, I, I need you to, to lecture in this course with me. Are you available on Thursday? I was dumbfounded, right? Like this iconic professor is asking me to lecture with him on Thursday afternoons. All of a sudden, I'm in a classroom full of people. One of the books he wants to read is Black Reconstruction. And Stanley and I get into a wicked debate because somebody gave me PDFs of Black Reconstruction. And he only wanted the students to look at two chapters of the book. And I distributed the PDFs. And we got into a wicked argument because Stanley had brought me to his apartment. And I was infatuated with all those books in his apartment. He says, well, what do you think I got those books? They're not PDFs. Those are books. You know, he would give me a hard time. But he just had a belief in people that was incredible that I still appreciate. And I would argue that because of Neil and Stanley, and particularly Stanley, I'm teaching a course at, in urbanism at the new school this semester, right? Um, I never, Stanley always said to me, and he said something, this is, I will never forget. You don't need a PhD to teach. You need a willingness to share knowledge, and you have that, Rob. So start sharing knowledge, right? It was the same way with Neil. Those two of them always pushed people out, but he saw something within me, and that's a quality that I've always appreciated in Stanley. He sees stuff in people and he pushes you in a certain direction, not for personal gain, for you to gain, right? Um, and, and it's for your own well-being. But um, again, that library in Stanley's house has always fascinated me. I used to, he would call me constantly over to Madison Avenue to sit and talk with him. But I think the one time that he really got to me and, and punctured my heart a little bit was in his rehab center on Houston Street after you know, his health started to deteriorate, he looked at me and he said, look, you know, the left, some, the left forum is something I care about. I know you care about it. I took a lot of shots from the community when I joined left forum, but Stanley, once I got into left forum, Stanley said something in my ear that I will never forget. He said to me, look, um, we need to push this in a di different direction and you have the wherewithal to do that. We need you to support us and help us do this thing. And I took a lot of shots from the community, but I did it because of Stanley whispering in my ear and the Stanley's belief in me as a human being. So Stanley, rest in peace, brother. We miss you. Thank you so much, Rob. And, and thank you, everyone. So the, we're going to have time for people to chime in and ask questions, but uh, I'm getting we are um, out of time. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for, for doing this. I, I like, like all of you, uh, know some of the versions of Stanley you're talking about and some of the newer, new, other versions I hadn't known. It's beautiful to hear. Um, so we're going to take a 12 minute break, basically. The next panel starts at 4.30, uh, I think. And um, thanks again for all your, for all your uh, remembrances and thoughts. Bye, thank everyone. you.